Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Quarto Short Course, brought to you by National Institute of Statistical Sciences, the Graduate Student Network, GSM. Um, our instructor today is Dr. Mini Santikaya Rangdel, and I um, am a faculty advisor of the GSM. My name is Piamo Liu, and I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Mathematical Sciences at Bentley University. Uh, I'm going to do a uh, quick introduction to our instructor today. And I'm going to also introduce you to the GSM Graduate Student Network. Dr. Mini Santikaya Rondel is a professor of the practice and the director of undergraduate studies at the Department of Statistical Science and an affiliated faculty in the Computational Media, Arts and Cultures program at Duke University. Her work focuses on innovation in statistics and data science pedagogy with an emphasis on computing, reproducible research, student-centered learning, and open source education. She works on integrating computation into the undergraduate statistics curriculum using reproducible research methodologies and analysis of real and complex data sets. In spring 2023, she is teaching STAT 313, Advanced Data Visualization. In addition to her academic position, she also works with POSIT, where she focuses primarily on education for open source R packages, as well as building resources and tools for educators teaching statistics and data science with R and R Studio. You can uh, find her and learn more about her on Mastodon. Uh, Dr. Mini Santikaya Rondel is teaching another course for the GSM this fall, so stay tuned. When we have more details, we'll let you know. Uh, before we uh, start learning Quoto today, um, I'd like to introduce uh, the NICE GSM to you. Our network creates connections among graduate students from different academic institutions. The network helps graduate students tackle challenges of, of graduate programs. Um, we provide career support for graduate students and provide continuing support for alumni of the network. Throughout the year, um, we plan a variety of activities, including webinars, networking socials, alumni events, short courses like this one we're having today, and our annual graduate student research conference. The 2023 graduate student research conference is coming this May on Saturday and Sunday on the 20th and 21st. This will be our third uh, graduate student research conference. We are ac accepting abstracts now. So if you are yet to be part of the network, please go to our website and join the network by filling out a form. The network will keep you posted on the events we organize. Without further ado, uh, welcome Mini, and uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, thank you very much and uh, lovely to be here. So um, let me go ahead and share my screen and arrange my windows for a second and then we'll take things from there. Right, one more. <clears throat> okay, very good. All right, so um, welcome to the short course today. I have um, what I'm going to do for today is um, go through a set of slides, and then we're going to do a bit of a live demo, and then we have an exercise for you all to work on, and then we're going to come back and sort of wrap things up. And I am titling this Hello Corto, A World of Possibilities for Reproducible Publishing. As I go through um, my talk and my demo, um, I'll also try to watch the chat if there are questions that feel like just clarification questions, particularly during the live demo part for something I have just shown. And if that's the case, I can try to address it right on the spot. If it looks like it's more of a discussion question, keeping those types of questions um, towards the later end where we can do a more relaxed Q&A uh, would be helpful. And I'm happy to sort of sift through them as is as well. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about um, Quarto. So what is Quarto? 
Porto is a new, um, and so at this point, about a year old open source scientific and technical publishing system. It aims to make the process of creating and collaborating dramatically better. So what you can see in the schematic here is that with Quarto, you can be working with pretty much any computational language. I will be giving examples based on R today because that is the language I use for data analysis, but you could be working in Python, you could be working in Observable, Julia, or more. And we can sort of co uh, combine our computation and our prose in a Quarto document and outcomes a uh, document of many, many formats. Um, and you can do multiple formats or you can do one of these formats at a time, HTML, PDF, Word, or more. So um, if you are like me are sort of entering this uh, venture from um, uh, R and statistics background, chances are you're familiar with R Markdown. So I'd love to hear if um, in the chat, if you can chime in, if you've used R Markdown before or never used it, it would give me a sense of uh, who is on the audience and what your expertise level is. And in the meantime, I will um, introduce Corto from the eye of an R Markdown user. So Corto unifies and extends extends the R Markdown ecosystem. So what I mean by unifies is that it unifies it for people who love R Markdown. Um, if you are an R Markdown user, chances are you've used a, one package for making your slides, uh, another package for making uh, maybe a website, another package for writing a manuscript, another package for creating a website, all based on our markdown. So things like blog down, book down, sure engine, these all enter the uh, sort of conversation. What Corto does is sort of takes the experience of having built and maintained these packages over a decade and brings them all together into a single system. And when I say system, I mean a system, not a single R package, but a command line interface that sort of um, does it all in one place. And Quarto also extends the R Markdown ecosystem for people who don't know R Markdown. So if you are, on the other hand, um, a, a Jupyter user, for example, who does their computation and authoring in Jupyter Notebooks, um, Quarto provides a space for you to sort of like enter in the system and also not be bound by writing R code or not be bound by having to use a package like Reticulate, which will allow you to sort of use Python code inside of our studio, but natively support these other computational languages. Um, how does it, how does Quarto unify and extend it? Uh, one of the things is consistent implementation of attractive and handy features across outputs. For example, tab sets, where if you have an, a web-based output like HTML, you can click on tabs. These that were available in some R Markdown outputs and not others. Things like code folding, where you can easily fold it, so hide and show your code in a document, uh, or syntax highlighting. It also has more accessible defaults, as well as better support for accessibility. So by default, the Quarto theme has better color contrast, and it also brings in for features if, uh, for you to make your documents more accessible to more people. It also has guardrails, which is particularly helpful for new learners. Uh, for example, YAML completion. Forgot what the name of a code chunk option is? Well, you can take advantage of something like YAML completion where it will suggest options for you instead of you having to go Google around it. Um, and it also has informative syntax errors, which I think can be incredibly helpful when you're rendering a document and run into an issue. It's sometimes hard to tell, is it my R code that's failing or is it something I'm doing outside of my R code? And the informative syntax errors are helpful for diagnosing those. And as I said, in addition with support for other languages like Python, Julio Observable, uh, and more via the Jupyter engine for executable code chunks. So it will use the Knitter engine by default if you're writing only R code or the Jupyter engine if you're using any of the other languages. So <laughs> what we're going to do for the next bit is we're going to see Quarto in action. If you would like to follow along, I'm going to share this link in the chat with you. Um, you can go here and we're going to start with the contents of this repository. So I'll go there in a second. You can either clone the repository to get started or you can if you want download it. So let me go ahead and get out of this view. Um, 
All right, and let's go to this link. So you will see that I have a repository here. And if you would like to uh, clone the repository, you can click on code and then sort of copy the link from here and use it to clone it. Or if you're not a GitHub user and this is um, you know, not second nature to you, no problem at all. If you would like to follow along, you can just click on download zip, which will download a zip uh, version of this um, folder onto your computer. And then you should be able to open up um, unzip the file and then open it up using um, by double cl clicking on this rproj file to launch our studio for yourself. I am going to go ahead and get started from there. And also, if you prefer, you can just uh, sort of sit back, relax and watch what's happening here. So let's go to the files pane. I've opened this. Um, I have opened this um, uh, document and I'm uh, sorry, this project, and I'm going to go to the files pane. I am going to do one thing in order to make sure that I'm at the same place with those who choose to follow along. I'm going to delete these rendered talk files, which were my slides that I was talking about, and we'll get to that in a second. And I am going to op uh, focus on this file called index.qmd. I see that we have plenty of our markdown users in the audience. So you are probably used to um, files that end with .rmd for our markdown. So these are Corto Markdown Documents .qmd. So let's go ahead and open that up. And I am opening up this uh, document in the Corto Vision, uh, sorry, in the RStudio Visual Editor. Um, if you are a long-term RStudio user, um, you might be a little bit more used to seeing documents that look like this. And that, that look is still definitely available. And for some people, that's their preferred method of authoring. Um, so, um, but if you want to use the visual editor, which is what I'm going to demo, you can sort of switch over to the visual editor, which this uh, document is going to open by default. Um, there are four um, pack R packages that are being used in this very tiny analysis here. When you open the document, if those packages are not installed for you, um, our studio will probably um, bring up a banner here saying, would you like to install those packages? And if they're not installed for you, please go ahead and do install them. Uh, but otherwise, if you already have them installed, you should be able to um, go ahead. So let's go ahead and render this document. So instead of the word knit, I'm using the word uh, render here. Let's go ahead and render this document. And then let's compare our input to our output. A handy RStudio feature I'll demo here, or at least I find handy, is being able to view your document in the viewer pane here, as opposed to in a pop-up window. And in our, if you like that view, you can click on the little gear icon next to the render button. And you'll see that I have uh, the option that I have chosen is preview in viewer pane as opposed to preview in window, which would bring up a pop up window for me to view my document. In. So um, what we're seeing here is that I have a document with what we call a YAML on top, which is the metadata of my document metadata things like the title of the document the format in which I want my output to be, which will play with other formats in a little bit, and also the editor that I want to use by default. I said that I wanted to use the visual editor, and I put that there so that it would pop up for each of you so that you can sort of uh, see the visual editor experience as well. Let's add another field to this. I could say something like, I'm going to add an author field, so what I have done here is I've started typing AU for author, and then I have tabbed um, in order to get the YAML completion. And I'll say my name. I can type my name. And um, what I can do is now either click on the render button, or if I'm going to make many little updates to this, uh, and I want to see them rendered live, I can click on render on save, and then save my document. Um, and every time I save it, it's actually going to render it, and I can see the output here. So we can see 
um, input on one side and output on one side. And what's happening with the, um, the YAML um, on top is it's getting a particular styling for my output, right? It actually indicates who the author is and sort of like styles my name in a particular way. So now let's dive into the contents of this uh, document. So uh, one of the things that we might want to do, for example, is we might want to um, do things like um, add hyperlinks to it. So let's demo a few of the visual editor features here. Um, I have some headers and then I have some text and it says for this analysis, we'll use the penguins data set from the Palmer penguins package. Um, I might want to, for example, link to the package website for this package. Um, so the package website is here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, let me go ahead and copy this URL, go to my RStudio window. And in order to enter this hyperlink, I will click on the link icon here and paste that link and then hit OK. And you can see that when I save my document, it will render it again. And now I have a live hyperlink. So this feels uh, this should be a familiar experience for those of you who use things like Word or Google Docs. It's uh, very much what you see is what you get editor. But the neat thing under the hood is that when I've inserted that hyperlink, if I switch over to the source uh, version, the markdown code has been entered for that. So I didn't have to write the markdown. I could use the handy uh, tools that come with the visual editor for inserting that link, but the markdown is written for me. And why is that important? That means that I have a document that is plain text in its spirit, like under the hood, it is a plain text document. So if I do want to use something like version control for my document, let's go to the Git tab and see what that looks like. I can see the edits that I have made are very easy to uh, apply version control to because um, they're plain text and I can see exactly what has changed in my document and I can do things like, um, you know, write a commit message like added author and link, for example. Um, so under the hood, a plain text document, but when we're editing it, we get to take advantage of handy uh, sort of uh, what you see is what you get features. Things like being able to, um, you know, use uh, style our text, like uh, turn this into code text, for example, or use keyboard shortcuts like Command B for bolding or Command I for italicizing. So the idea is that, oops, sorry. The things that you use um, in like sort of other avenues in your life, maybe in things like authoring Google Docs or in uh, Word now are sort of accessible to you when you're writing computational documents as well. So we've talked a little bit about just writing plain text, but that's not really where the excitement is. Where the excitement really is, is when we have um, code chunks uh, in our, um, in our document. So let's go ahead and take a look at these code chunks. Um, over here, for example, I have a code chunk that loads a bunch of packages. What if I wanted to, um, what if I wanted to hide this code chunk? Okay. I could do something like um, eco. So the code chunk option that I can use is eco. And I want to say, I want to set this to false. And if I render this document, it's going to hide that particular code chunk from my output. So we can see that that is gone, but clearly the functionality of that code chunk is here because without loading these packages, I wouldn't have been able to create these visualizations and these tables, for example. So if your audience does not need to see your code, you can easily still keep your code in your source document, but be able to, um, um, share a version of the document that is not a um, that is not that does not include the code. If you want to uh, sort of exclude the code from all of your uh, code uh, from your entire document, you could of course go ahead and add this code chunk option to every single one of your chunks. But you can imagine that's going to get pretty cumbersome. 
So instead, what we can do is we can do it at the document level. So we can say that this is an execute option. And you can see that I have all of my options are available to me as soon as I hit enter. I want to set eco to false. And let's go ahead and save this again, just to take a look at what that looks like. And as a result, I have a report that hides all of my code. I still have a warning here, so maybe I want to hide that as well. It's a warning ggplot2 is giving because I have some NAs in my data. So let's say I'm happy with that and I just want to, whoops, sorry, we want to do warning false. I, we, I don't want the warnings to be shown. So I can go ahead and do that as well. And here we can see basically that as an output, I have um, you know, a document with no code. What if I wanted a different output? What if not HTML, but I wanted something like PDF? So no change needs to happen to the content of my document. Just in my YAML, I'm changing HTML to PDF. And let's go ahead and save that. And this is going to now invoke LaTeX under the hood and create a PDF document for me. Um, PDF takes a tad longer to render and I want to show you a few features here. So I'm going to take this back to HTML and let's go ahead and bring our code back to uh, just so we can get back to our document in its original state. Um, and then we can show you some features about the code. Um, so one of the things I said was um, a feature called code fold uh, that might be of interest. So this could be something that would be of interest if your audience might be interested in the code. Um, so let's go ahead and set code fold, fold to true. And let's see what that does for us. So we can see that I have in my output, my figure is there and my code is accessible, <clears throat> but it's not there by default. So we can hide the code, but then we can um, allow people to see it if they want to. This can, I think, be uh, one of the ways I use this regularly is in a teaching scenario where I want students to maybe first focus on the output and sort of maybe in, do some interpretation, but then dive into it and look at the code as well. Um, another thing that we can do is, so we have this figure here um, and based on the figure, we might expect our audience to be able to say something about trends in the data. So for these three species of penguins, we're seeing a positive relationship between their bill, which is kind of like their big beak, their bill length and bill depth. Um, this sort of insight is available to the cited user, but we talked about accessibility features. How do we make this document accessible to those who might not be able to see this, um, this figure as well? So a, um, a, another chunk option that's available in Quarto is um, the ability to write alternative text. So this will be text that's available to a screen reader, for example. And here we would want to describe what we're seeing in the figure. A scatter plot of bill depth versus length of three species of penguins showing a positive, uh, maybe linear relationship. Um, we probably want to say a bit more than this, but I wanted to give here the example of a code chunk option that's a little bit long, as you can see. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry about that. Um, so it's a little bit long and a little bit annoying, in my opinion, with the way the text is wrapping to be able to read. Um, so what I can do here is I can say, I'm going to put that vertical bar to say, I'm going to indicate a longer code chunk option. I will indent this a little bit and add some uh, line breaks. Okay, 
So let's go ahead and render this document and see what happens to this text that we've written. In my output, it's nowhere to be found, right? And that is in fact, what we would expect to happen. I'm going to pop this output uh, out to my browser with the show in new window button here. And then I am going to hover over this image and right click on it. And let's go ahead and inspect sort of the HTML source code. So we can see that there's some HTML, you know, serving this document. And in here, in fact, the alternative text we wrote is here. So it's not in our output, which is not where we intended for it to be, but it is available to a screen reader, which makes your documents um, a lot more accessible. And really simply, you do not have to learn how to write HTML code and how to inject this alternative text directly into the HTML code. We can use an R code chunk option um, in order to be able to do that. Um, I will show you one other code chunk option here, uh, which is one of my favorite ones in the context of teaching. So I'm going to set eco, we've talked about true and false, to fenced. So if you're teaching how to use Corto, on the other hand, you might want to, you know, show folks that we, when we type these code chunks, we actually have them uh, sort of in these fences uh, with the back ticks and then the, uh, the uh, curly braces um, in which we indicate the engine. So in this case, I'm using R, it could say Python in there as well. It can be pretty cumbersome to get this look on your output. You would have to add like a fake code chunk to do that. With the eco fenced option, you can easily show how to write Corto documents and how to write code chunk options as well. All right, so let's get rid of that. Um, now, what we're going to do next is start thinking about, all right, I can write a simple document, but how do I really write sort of professional looking documents? How do I make my way into writing a manuscript perhaps with Quarto? So one of the things that you might want to do is you have some narrative and then it refers to a figure that comes underneath it. So if that's what we want to do, um, there are two things that we need to add to our document in order to make this cross-referencing happen. The first is that the label for my code chunk needs to start with uh, the prefix fig for figure. So that's the first thing. It doesn't matter what the rest of it is, but it needs to start with fig dash. And the other thing is that I need to have another code chunk option, which is fig cap for a caption for my figure. And I am going to write something like, um, maybe we can cheat from here. Um, something like this, for example, for our caption. So if I just render this document, we can see that my figure has now been numbered and it has gained a caption. The next thing that we need to do is we need to be able to refer to it or cross-reference it from our text. So I am going to say, instead of saying the figure below, I want to insert a cross-reference. And you can see that there are different types of cross-references that I can insert. I could be referring to an equation or a theorem. In this case, it's a figure. And I can basically just select that from here and it will allow me to sort of insert that cross-reference in place and add the text figure and then the number of that figure right into my text. So I've been able to add this cross-reference and the same option works regardless of your output. It could be a PDF or it could be an HTML. Another thing we might wanna cross-reference is tables. So I have further down here a table and the process is very similar. Once again, I need to add a suffix to my label. In this case, that suffix is going to be TBL instead of fig, and I need to add a caption. So let's go ahead and add that caption, and we'll say these are the first 10 rows of the Penguin's data frame. And let's go ahead and save that. All right, and I have gained a um, 
caption for my table as well. And similarly, now I can go ahead and let me show you another way of sort of navigating these tools. So if you are a person who likes using your mouse, insert and then citation is how you might wanna do it. If you like keyboard shortcuts, you might use command and then forward slash. Um, and or just forward slash at the beginning of a line or command and forward slash elsewhere in the line. And this will bring up this insert anything tool. And then I can say, I want to insert a citation. Oh, whoops, sorry, not a citation. I want to insert a cross-reference. We'll see citations in a second, a cross-reference. Um, oh, let's go ahead and save our document. So that table is not available to me here. It's a mistake I make often because I've not saved my document after I have made those changes to say that it needs to be available to me. And um, so I can insert it that way, or I can actually type at TBL Penguins Top 10, which is the name of that, um, of that table. And we can see that now I have a cross-reference to my table as well. So we've talked about sort of just manipulating text. We've talked about adding some chunk options for hiding and showing our code. And now we've talked about cross-references. One other thing you're probably going to want to do if you are um, uh, writing like a document uh, or a manuscript with uh, Quarto is add citations. So I'm going to show you one way of adding citations now and then another way a little bit later. Um, so let's suppose that I want to add a citation from a DOI. Um, so I have the data set that we're using here, the Penguins data set from the Palmer Penguins package actually comes from a paper that was published. And let's say that I want to cite that paper right here. I can say that I want to add a citation. I'm going to add it from a DOI. And I had previously looked up the DOI of this paper. So here is the paper. So I paste the DOI here and our studio will search for that DOI and then bring the, um, bring the entry for me. I can choose to add an in-text citation. So that would be the one that says, you know, so-and-so 2014 says, or one that's not in text. So that would be in parentheses. So I don't want it to be in text and I'm going to go ahead and insert the citation and watch for some of the changes that happen in my document. One, the expected changes, I added a citation, great. Another thing that happened is my YAML gained a new line. It gained a new line that says, for bibliography, go to the references.bib file. I didn't create that file. Our studio created it for me. And we can see that that file has been created here. And in that file, we can see the bib entry for that paper. So this is the sort of thing in a past life, I used to copy and paste from Google Scholar, and now I don't need to do that anymore. Um, if there already is a references.bib file and you want to add another citation, um, it will just keep adding to this. Uh, and if so if there isn't one, it will create it for you. So let's look at our rendered document. So in my rendered document, I can hover over this uh, reference and I can see my citation here. And if I scroll to the very bottom of my document, um, I can um, I can see my references. And no, I did not need to do a backslash site or site P. The, um, the syntax that it uses is the square bracket. So if you already have some bib entries in a bib file, and you know their names, and you want to manually, let's say, refer to them, you can do at and then the name of the bib entry. Um, but if you just use the insert citation tool um, and add, it will sort of like add it for you. It will create, I didn't have to manually type it, the insert citation tool created it and put that text in there for me. And if I was to once again, convert things to a PDF now, we'll see that the citations work in exactly the same way. So I don't have to change how I'm doing my citation. They are actually linked here and they're listed at the bottom of my document as well.
All right, so we've talked about a single document and we've also talked about um, um, creating um, you know, an HTML or a PDF document. Those are probably not the only artifacts you generate. So let's talk about making slides for a second. So I'm going to take this document and I'm going to, with one click basically, convert it to a slide deck. And all I need to do in order to be able to do that is change my format from HTML to reveal.js for HTML based slides. And let's take a look at how things change for me. My um, YAML, my title and my author field now go to a um, um, title slide. And from then on, each of my headings create a new um, slide for me. So each of these headings are now a new slide. And you can see that by default, reveal.js actually hides my code as well. Um, so let's go ahead and um, let's go ahead and um, see how we can sort of enhance our slides. And I'm going to answer the question in the chat quickly in the meantime. Um, what, how did we open the Git tab? So that was in the Git tab in our studio here. Uh, and if you don't have that Git tab, um, we can answer that question later in terms of how you ended up there. So usually in a slide deck, we tend to have sections and then within sections slides. So our outline tends to not be like this, but tends to be hierarchical, probably true for a paper as well. So let's go ahead and enter those. I'm going to enter using my insert anything tool, a uh, level one heading. So instead of a level two heading, a level one heading, and I'm going to call this introduction. And then let's say at the end of my introduction where I have some exploratory analysis, maybe I am going to enter another level one heading that maybe says analysis. And how about we add one slide here that says, modeling results. I'm not actually going to do any modeling right now, but let's imagine we had some code or something in there. And then another heading that has references, because remember those references we have at the end probably need their own slide. So let's go ahead and save this, these changes. And we can see that our um, slide deck has now gained these section um, identifying slides as well. In fact, if I click on these um, three uh, lines on the side of my uh, Quarto viewer here, I can see this hierarchical um, nature of this document that basically mimics my outline in my input, which the outline can be shown uh, by clicking on this little outline button here. Um, I have some handy tools available to me as well here. So I have things like make it full screen, show the speaker view where you can have speaker notes, or even a PDF export mode that your audience can just grab that as a PDF and print out their slides if they want. Um, now let's take a look at something where uh, what this uh, reveal J conversion to reveal JS did for me was to hide all of my code. I think with the assumption that, hey, you're giving a talk, you probably want to just show your results, probably not your code. But sometimes you might actually want to show your code when you're giving a presentation. I don't know, maybe particularly if you're teaching with it, for example. So let's go ahead and bring our code back. So I'm going to say execute eco true. Okay, reload the visual editor. So let's go ahead and save that. And let's take a look at what happens to this slide with the figure. I have my code, great, but uh, what happened is my figure is just really, really tiny. What's happening is it's trying to be helpful and squishing my um, figure down to the available space for me, which in this case is not very helpful. So to demo one functionality of Corto's uh, slides that I find very handy, um, what I can do is I can, with one chunk option, move that figure to the next slide. So I'm going to say that I want my output location to be the next slide. So fragment would mean appear in the next uh, sort of animation when you scroll forward. But I actually want it to appear on the next slide so that I can it can have as much room as possible. And let's go ahead and render that. 
So now I didn't have to write an additional code chunk that refers to uh, the first slide. My figure output has just been moved. This will work with figures and it will um, work with, um, it will also work with any sort of R output as well, say regression output or something like that. Um, and one other thing I'd like to uh, show uh, that can be helpful for um, making slides is when you want to do something like adding columns to your slides. So for example, over here, I have my uh, data. So let's go back to my data here. Um, say that I want to add, um, you know, something um, like an image or something here that we're going to use the penguins data set. So let's go ahead and insert some columns. So I'm going to use my insert anything tool again. So I'm pressing forward slash, or I can do it using the insert menu as well. Um, so in this case, I want to do columns. I want two slide columns. For my first column, I want this information to go here. For this analysis, we'll use uh, the Penguins data set. And then for my other column, what shall we do? Maybe let's go ahead and go to this website and maybe let's copy this image or maybe save this image into our, um, okay, maybe I can't find it right away. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, sorry. I'm going to go ahead and save this image um, where I have this uh, file. Okay, Porto. Uh, let's go ahead and save it right here. And then let's go back. And I might say, um, insert an image. And let's go ahead and find that image that we had saved, saved which was the logo. Did it insert my image? I think it did not insert my image. Let me try one more time. Why it didn't? There we go. Okay. So I have inserted an image there as well. So I'm able to sort of do things like um, do things like um, insert images or like add columns, which tends to be one of the peskier things to do in sort of slides that are generated in a computational document pretty easily as well. Um, before I abandon the slides, I'd like to give one quick tip about uh, that you might use in the context of teaching, particularly if you're teaching code. So oftentimes when we're teaching code, for example, we might want to talk about, you know, certain aspects of our code. So we might want to say things like, I want to explain what aesthetic mappings are. So that's lines three through six. And then I want to talk a little bit about why did I use a colorblind scale? Um, in order to do that, I might want to highlight my code. So for your highlighting my code, I can use the code line numbers chunk option. And then I'm going to give a character string here that says first highlight code line numbers three to six, and then highlight code line number 10. Um, so that's a little bit longer. So for anyone who might be wishing to uh, follow along, I will put that in the chat as well while this is rendering. So now I have my code. When I advance my slides once, the num line numbers three to six are highlighted. And when I advance it one, my one more time, line number 10 is highlighted. Um, so what we've shown here is a variety of ways you can sort of enhance your slides and play around with the code in your slides as well. And we've added some functionality to this document now that um, that basically has, um, you know, added um, slide specific functionality. This idea of advancing through slides to highlight code is not something you would do in a static document. But one neat thing about Corto is that if we now change this back to an HTML document, um, it will just ask us to reload the visual editor. So let's go ahead and let it do that. It will happily render the document for you. 
and any features like columns that it knows to implement in the static document, it will do. And any features like code highlighting where it doesn't make any sense to have in a single document, it will silently ignore. So it doesn't make let you make you have to go back and edit your code, which I find very sort of nice because I often create some artifacts that then I present in different venues, you know, write a paper, but also write a talk about it, for example. Um, so we've talked about single documents, HTML and PDF, and we've talked about uh, slides. Um, so the next thing we're going to do um, is, well, what if we had multiple documents in a project? And in fact, we do. If you go back to, if you're following along with me, if you go back to this, uh, my files pane, there's the index.qmd document that we've been working with. And then there is also the talk.qmd document that were my slides that I started with. So I'm going to clean up here a little bit. I'm going to delete any artifacts that were the result of us playing around with things. So creating, um, you know, artifacts from our rendering the document, the HTML output or the PDF output, just so we can see exactly what source files are in here a talk.qmd file and an index.qmd file. And I have a references.bib file to go along with it as well. So what we can do next is create a website that links to both of these. In order to do that, I'm going to create a new file. So let's close out of these and let's go ahead and add a new text file. And it's important, the name of this text file is important. It's going to be called underscore quarto.yml. So we have a new file called quarto yaml. And in this file, I'm going to say that I'm creating a quarto project. The type of this project is a website. You can see that I'm using the um, tab completion again. This website should have a title. Maybe let's title it Hello Porto Nis or something like that. And I want my website to have a navigation bar on top. And on the left of that navigation bar, I just want to link to those two documents that I have, index.qmd and um, talk.qmd. So a website with just two uh, pages one is the page that we've been playing with, the penguins analysis, and the other one is my slides. What I'm going to do in our studio right now is relaunch this project. So I'm in an RStudio project, and I'm going to go ahead and relaunch this project from the project view. And when I relaunch the project, you'll note that I gained a new tab. So we had mentioned the Git tab before. I've now gained a new tab called Build. And in here, there's a button called Render Website. <clears throat> and let's go ahead and render this website. And voila, we have a website with a navigation bar. It has two pages. One of them is my index.qmd file, the document we've been playing with. And the other one is the slides from my talk, which was the talk.qmd file that was there. So now let's go back and um, render this website one more time. And I'll show you one feature of websites. Uh, we won't dive too far into making websites as that's going to be the, the focus of the next um, workshop that we'll have in the fall. So I only want to show you one thing. The top bar of this website looks not good. I mean, it's not clear that these are going to be slides. It's not clear what this is. It's just grabbing the titles of those documents. So what we might want to do is to say, I want to give them some names. So um, this is going to be the link, the href, but the text I want to give it might be home. And maybe the text for my, this one could be slides. And this can say, when someone clicks on slides, go to talk.qmd. So let's go ahead and render the website one more time. And here we go. 
we actually have been able to sort of uh, change this up so that our pages actually have reasonable names right now. Um, we've basically created a website in like less than five minutes. And the way of doing that was writing a single YAML file that tells Corta how to bring things together. Of course, enhancing your website could be a lot more time consuming than this, but at least we are able to get to a point where we can create something. Um, the last step of making a website is getting it to a point where you can actually publish it, right? You want to be able to publish it with the world. So, for example, I know by the end of this talk, somebody's going to ask me, will you share a link to your slides? So let's go ahead and do that. And in order to do that, I'm going to veer away from the buttons on our studio for a second, go to my terminal and type Corto Publish. And I'm going to publish this. You can see that I have some options for publishing. I can publish to GitHub Pages, to Posit Connect, which is a pro product of uh, Posit, to Netlify, which if you've worked with Blog Down before, you might know about, or Confluence, which is commonly used in industry settings as like a wiki knowledge sharing space. But we're going to publish on Porto Pubs. And for those of you who are familiar with our markdown, this is like our pubs, but the Corto version of it. It is a free web hosting service. And let's go ahead and publish it. If this is the first time you're doing this, it's going to ask you to create an account for you. I have one, up, so I'm going to go ahead and publish there. Let's say that I do authorize. I guess I hadn't done it in a while. And hit yes. And yes, there we go. Let's go ahead and allow. And it says that site name is going to be Hello Corto Nis, which is what I had decided. Um, I can give it another name here. Maybe I can type it a little bit better. Hello Corto Nis. And let's go ahead and uh, let that publish it. All right, we have a website that's live and ready to go. Here it is. And if you would like a link to it, I'm going to put that in the chat as well. So without doing much configuration, we were able to go ahead and create a website and publish it as well. And now I have a link to my slides too. So now we've talked about single documents, HTML and PDF. We've talked about, um, documents that are that that are slides and we've talked about websites. The one thing we haven't quite touched on just yet is uh, creating journal articles. So let's go ahead and finally give an example of that. Now obviously, you know, we can keep going with this uh, file that we had, this index.qmd and like add our analysis, render it to PDF and that could be sort of like a journal article. But the reality is, journals tend to want things in a particular format. And so you need to start with like a LaTeX template or something in order to be able to get there. So let me go to um, the Corto website. Um, and I will put this in the chat as well. So here are uh, is uh, information on the Corto website on creating uh, journal articles. And it will point you to a GitHub repository where there are already some uh, journal formats available. And this is a growing list. And the nice thing is the JASA format, the American Statistical Association format is available there as well. So let's go ahead and go there. And I am going to go ahead and basically copy this code where it tells me how to create one of these. And I'm going to, and for this bit, um, if you want to just follow along, you're going to have a chance in a little bit to practice it yourselves. So I'm going to say, I want to uh, use this template. It asks me, do I trust the authors of this template? Yes, I do. 
what should my paper be called? I'm going to call my paper my awesome paper. And it creates a new folder for me. And in it, I have a QMD file. And let me go ahead and render this file. And for those of you who may have submitted to um, a journal that uses the ASA format, this format should look very familiar. And it's a template that comes with some examples on how to include, you know, different things like um, uh, differently formatted text, citations, so on and so forth. And you obviously would replace this with your own text. Um, I rushed through this, but I rushed through this for a reason. You're going to have a few minutes to work on this in a second. So before we do that, though, I want to sort of wrap up my conversation on um, what we were um, um, on, like what Corto is. So I'm going to pick up on my slides for a second and say a few words, and then we're going to go back and give you 15 minutes to work on the Your Turn uh, assignment. So some parting remarks for me, um, the Cordo CLI is, um, it's a command line interface and it orchestrates basically each step of rendering. So we start with a QMD document and then depending on the code in there, um, either you explicitly choose or Cordo chooses for you the computational engine you want to use, Knitter or, uh, or Jupyter. And running the code chunks, it creates a plain text markdown document that has your text and the results of your code. Then this gets piped through a pandoc to get to the various outputs. So HTML, PDF, Word, so on and so forth. And Corto is doing the orchestration in each of these steps. You are not having to manually intervene at any point. You're typing in the QMD document and you get your output out. If you're interested in learning more, the Corto website is where I would get started. And if this is your first introduction to Corto today, the Get Started um, page is probably very useful. You can download the latest release of Corto. And depending on which um, editor you like to use, so today I demoed our studio for you. But if you're a VS Code user or Jupyter Notebooks user, you can choose that experience and learn how to use Corto in there. Um, and if this is not your first time using Corto and you or you feel like I got a good sense of it, but I really want to know what else I can do with it, the guide is the place to go where you can then sort of learn about all the different uh, types of Corto documents and projects you can create. Um, there is a new Corto release coming out, which uh, we have actually used today, a pre-release version of it. And it has a bunch of really neat features, as you can see. Um, and, um, you know, as new versions of Corto come out, the team tries as much as possible to sort of incorporate feedback and needs of the users. And if you're interested in sort of learning about what's new in Corto, the Corto blog is a great place to follow. So. Thank you for listening so far, but I'm not leaving just yet. What we're going to do is we're going to ask you to work on the Your Turn exercise. And in the meantime, while you work on it, I'll be hanging on here. Um, so feel free to put questions in the chat and I'm happy to help out. And then I think we should have some time for Q&A at the end of that as well. And the Your Turn exercise is what I sort of rushed through, but I want you to do a little bit more with it. We would like you to go to the, um, the JASA template, although if you prefer to use a different template because that's, you know, you tend to submit to PLOS more, for example, feel free to do so. This is my suggestion for a starting place. Follow the instructions under creating a new article so that you also end up with a folder that is named however you want to name your paper folder and has then a QMD template in there. Add your author details and render the document. And then I would like you to try adding a citation, uh, like using the DOI citation uh, entering method that I showed earlier. And we'll give you 15 minutes to work on it and ask any questions along the way. All right. So um, any questions specifically um, about this or maybe let me uh, let me go ahead and demo this quickly and see uh, see if there are any questions along the way. 
So um, I have done the creating the template before. Was there anyone who was having difficulty getting to this point of creating the template with the um, in the uh, terminal with Corto template and then getting a folder um, that has a template to work with? Okay, so we had some who had trouble. So let's go back and sort of take it from there. So I'm going to click on this link here uh, where it says, if you want to create a new article, uh, you want to use uh, this command. So remember we said Cordo is a command line interface and we can from the command line use it. So we wanted to, um, we want to go ahead and copy this. And I am actually going to delete this folder from here so that I can start from scratch. And I am going to say in my terminal, this is what I want to do. Uh, the directory name, I'll call it my paper this time. And now it created a folder called my paper. So if you're having difficulty going from that command line of create this and then being prompted to ask, um, being prompted to um, create this folder, then I might imagine something off with your installation and, or something that we would need to sort of get into uh, in a little bit more detail. But I would anticipate that running that in the command line to actually create this folder for you. And remember that it'll create the folder in your working directory. So if you're working in an RStudio project, your files pane is likely directed there. But if you are not working in an RStudio project, it may have just created it in your home directory. So that's something to take note of. And let's go ahead and open this document. So our, um, our um, prompt said to add a title, uh, maybe something like my awesome paper on penguins could be the title. Uh, this is uh, my name can be inserted here. Um, and let's go ahead and render this document real quick. And I'm going to now, so we can see that title is there and my name is there. I'm gonna go ahead and go to the visual editor and say, okay. And let's go ahead and insert a citation. I am going to just pick any place here and I am going to go ahead and say, insert citation. And let's talk about what a few of you are talking about in the, um, in the chat. So I have Zotero running on my computer. And let's say that I've used Zotero elsewhere and it basically like has my library. If I had other folders here, those would be visible as well. And, you know, in this case, I have a paper of mine that's there as an um, example. And I'm going to go ahead and basically select any paper from my Zotero library and be able to add that here. And let's go ahead and render that document. If I go to my files pane, and look in my bib file, bibliography.bib. Um, we should be able to see at the very end of my document that this has basically been added. And um, oh, it looks like it's complaining because this link was broken. So let's go ahead and fix that link maybe and try to um, render it again. That must be just something uh, in, my, in my Zotero entry. So there was a ampersand in the link and that's why it was complaining because that's what LaTeX likes to do. But it basically inserted it to my bib file and it should be listed at the end along with the other references that were included in the default template. We have basically added this as a reference there as well. So uh, we've shown you how to insert citations from a DOI, and now we've, I've shown you how to insert citations from your Zotero library as well. And you can see that there are other options like using Crossref, Datacite, PubMed, so on and so forth. But something that tends to be a pretty pesky thing to do is eased quite a bit with the use of the visual editor um, and then the affordances that Quarto provides as well. So any questions about the, the journal article example before we go back and try to answer some of the um, other questions uh, that were in the chat? All right. 
think not. So let me go back. There was a question from uh, James asking about if in the, in your R code that you want to display is quite long, does Corto automatically include slide down and slide across tools? So this would be um, the answer is yes. And in order to sort of show both of them, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to convert this to slides again, because you know, long code is more of a problem if you have slides as opposed to uh, if you have a sort of a individual document. And let's go down here and let's add, you know, some more code. Um, let's maybe just copy this one more time or something. Um, and maybe let's do something cool like layout and call so that we have these things. Um, maybe uh, twice, okay? Um, I will change one of the, um, uh, one of the, uh, um, variables just so we can have slightly different code. And let's go ahead and render this document to see how things look. So over here, um, we can see that I have longer code. So it is in fact scrolling and maybe something we can do is add a title that is a really long title. Let's see if that's long enough to trigger something. And you can see that you can also do the slide across. So it adds those automatically for these documents. Um, if you have PDF though, they will probably got, get cut off. So you're gonna wanna be careful about that. Um, creating a book from Corto. Yeah, you can create a book from Corto just like you can create um, a website from Corto. And the difference there is going to be that in your Corto YAML, instead of website, you can choose book. And then instead of things like a nav bar, you will have something like uh, chapters. So to give you all an example of a quarter of book, uh, we've been working on the second edition of R for Data Science recently. So this is written in Corto. And if we go to the repository and look at the Corto YAML, you will see that things look familiar. Project, in this case, type book. And instead of a navigation bar, we actually have chapters that are listed. All right, so I think I answered the two questions. There's one other question from Paritosh, but I am not sure how to answer that without seeing what's happening. Um, so um, if there are any other questions, I'd be happy to answer. Um, so Attendees of our session today, um, since we have different um, levels of proficiency in R Markdown, definitely in Quarto. Mm -hmm. um, so we just say that um, for people who um, have, have some basic knowledge about R Markdown, um, do they, should they just start learning Quarto? Um, yeah, good or... question. Um, so let me give you two answers for that. There is absolutely no reason to change what you're doing just to use Quarto out of fear that our markdown won't work anymore. So that is not, you know, like, let's say that you're in the middle of writing your thesis with our markdown, or you're in the middle of uh, writing a journal article with the articles package, leveraging our markdown or writing a book with book down. If something that I've shown or something in Quarto is attractive and that's why you want to move, of course, but otherwise there is no, there's no reason to have to change things. And in fact, one of the neat things about Quarto is that if later on you write a Quarto project, so let's say you make a website, but you have some old documents written as RMD, you can literally put them in there as is. Quarto will render RMD files as well. <clears throat> that being said, if you're earlier on in your journey and you're about to invest some time into learning something new, then I would say, yeah, go ahead and start learning Quarto. Great, great answers, then thank you. Um, I noticed that there were two questions uh, while uh, you were demonstrating. Um, there were one question about how to add a bibliography and there was a question uh, about Echo. Um, since we're going to share the recording with everyone who is registered and today, um, I believe 
um, all, uh, both questions were actually answered <laughs> during, uh, during the session. So. Yeah, and there's a new question, the code fold option. Um, I think code fold works in our markdown and in Corto, uh, but I believe so. I believe so. The, so here's the thing. It does, I'm fairly certain it works in both our markdown and Corto. The thing is, does it work with every package that our markdown, that is our markdown base that I'm not sure. So when I mentioned that thing about Corto unifies our markdown functionality, like it is possible code fold works in something like, um, blog down, but not book down. You know, it, there could be some things like that. There are some chunk options that work in some and not the others. And the nice thing with Corto is that if they work in one, they work in the other as well. <clears throat> yeah, there was a question about inserting equations. So let's give that a try. So you're going to make me write LaTeX on live. I will try it. <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and do that. Um, so let's go ahead and say that I want to insert an equation here. I'm going to use my insert anything tool to say that I want, uh, you know, display math in this case. And I might say something like. Um, yeah, share screen. Oh, I'm not sharing my screen. OK. One second, let's start over then. Okay, here we go. So I am going to either use my insert anything tool to say I want to uh, insert display map, or I could have done that uh, from here as well, um, either inline math or display math. And I can say something like um, y hat equals, I don't know, beta zero plus beta one. Um, and then let's say something like this, okay? So I insert an equation just using plain LaTeX, basically what I know about LaTeX. And um, it's actually in the visual editor rendered for me so I can see exactly what that equation looks like. If I double click on it, I can go ahead and render it further. Um, if I want to do inline, so I can here do um, something like inline math, um, and there I can just use um, the single dollar signs and I can insert inline math and it will render it for me as well. But when I double click on it, it allows me to um, edit it further. Does that answer the question? All right, great. Any other questions? Oh, loading LaTeX packages. So yes, that is also doable. Um, so the way we do that is we would add something, and I'll get to that thing in a second, in the YAML that basically allows you to list um, sort of the LaTeX packages that you want to include in the header. Um, so let me... Go ahead and see if I can quickly find what that is. Mm. Okay, I can't find uh, right off the um, top of my head exactly which YAML entry that is going to be. It might be, um, it might be one of these. Yeah, so something, so you can do include before body or include after body or include in header where you can do things like uh, write LaTeX code, like use package and then um, the curly braces. So you, you can do that in the header. Um, Python packages, on the other hand, would not be something you necessarily load in the header. That's going to be something you load in a chunk but instead of an R chunk, you would do that in a uh, Python code chunk. So um, the LaTeX stuff, because that's going to touch the text as opposed to the executable code chunks happens in the YAML, 
versus uh, anything that's related to the compute in the document is going to happen in the code cells. So here I can uh, load the, you know, any Python libraries. All right, and if not, thank you, Mini, for such a wonderful session, and thank you for your participation. Thanks. Bye. Bye.